Okay, good afternoon again. So you nine o'clock this morning, saw you at noon. Uh, we would like to really make this more of a Q and A kind of an informal conversation uh, because that's the way that the relationship with the city of Sullivan and all of the Hoosier communities have been with Kevin Hall. Um, very humble, uh, excellent leader. We really appreciate the governor being here today to kind of do some Q and A. The reason why the governor's here, we've been in his in contact with his office immediately. Uh, with Tyler, thank you, Tyler, wherever he's he's over here. Uh, so right away, I bragged on all the elected officials earlier, but I can't say enough. What great of a job that they have done. So, we, Governor, we really appreciate you coming down here today. And uh, after we have some Q&A and have some questions, you're all more than welcome to join us on location because the Governor definitely made, uh, made it well known to us that he wanted to be boots on the ground, uh, literally, and see exactly the devastation and what's happened uh, here in this uh, great community. So, Governor, thank you for coming. Mayor, yeah. Uh, hey, it's for this occasion that we're uh, together once again, but I have full confidence that even after the dark uh, storm, that it will be light again, and there will be a renaissance, and we will restore, and we will rebuild better than ever. And uh, we're, we're just seeing so many people. The hard thing now is managing all that assistance that wants to rush to the scene. My wife and I, first and foremost, want to pass on our condolences to the three Hoosier souls uh, that we lost um, due to this um, natural disaster. It was just that. Damage, destruction, disaster. But again, we will rebuild. And it's been a uh, long night for a lot of people, and a long day. There's immediate 24-hour needs, and there'll be next week needs, and there'll be for the foreseeable future uh, as we rebuild this community. Earlier today, I did uh, officially sign a declaration for a state of emergency in two counties, Sullivan and Johnson counties. We had a lot of uh, trees snapped in two, power lines obviously down, homes and businesses, roofs ripped off. Countless uh, spots of destruction all over the state. We were tracking about 18 counties that had lost power at one point. And but Sullivan and Johnson counties were hammered the hardest. In addition to those lives lost, it's going to really call for us to do what we do um, better than anyone uh, that I can think of, and that is come together as a team. I have been in communication with the administrator for FEMA, uh, Deanne Criswell, and um, Administrator Criswell has assured us that in addition to all the local support that will be needed, all the state resources that will be uh, provided, uh, that FEMA, who has already been on the ground and will continue to be assessing and inventory, um, that those resources, as appropriate, will be made available as well. Talked to her back and forth a couple of times um, this morning and then pulled off the side of the road on the way down here in the parking lot of Boot City so I could have a little quiet, um, no, no road noise as we were going over what those 24 hour, the, the, the water needs, the food needs, the shelter needs, the, where the Salvation Army, where Red Cross, where the churches, uh, your operation, your emergency operations center here locally, how we're interfacing with uh, Mary and Steve Jones here with the State Fire Marshal, and Joel Thacker, who's been in constant communication. He's our director of Homeland Security. So this is a all hands on deck effort, and and will continue to be. It won't just be we're dropping parachutes in one day and and gone the next. This will be um, a memory that is seared into our minds forever, especially those people who were directly um, affected, um, but this is going to last for a long time and it's really so to rebuild. With that, happy to answer any questions or anyone here uh, will do the same. So Governor, we've got two different disaster areas in two geographically separate counties. Talk about the coordination that's taking place right now in terms of, all right, which units are we using where, and then also moving some of the lesser affected areas, like at one point you said, distracting. 
Well, to organize it, Mary, you might want to speak to this, but to organize it, it goes through our emergency operations center, which is up 24 hours a day. It has been since yesterday. There's three general phases. There's preparing for the storm, there's enduring it, and then there's the recovery phase. And that's exactly what we're doing all over the state of Indiana, is working with the locals, depending on what the damage is, inventorying that, making sure that that 211 uh, line is open for people to call in and not just express what happened, but also share the details so that we can follow up accordingly. Working with the local utilities, this is again a federal, state, local, and local meaning down to the organizations that are assisting with the uh, the help where it's needed. Add anything to that no, coordination. Very good answer. Well, again, we are working with the local officials every day. We are collecting all of the damage information. That's the process that we're in right now. And then that will help us inform the governor's office of where resources need to be strategically located. Declaring those two counties as uh, sites of natural disaster helps us expedite potential funding from the federal government. So uh, Dan Criswell knows that as of, as of about 1 o'clock today. They'll, they have, FEMA has personnel here as well, right now. We're still in the middle of the budget session. Do you potentially see uh, lawmakers stepping in and adding some additional line items to deal with this, or do our existing emergency funds? We, we, we have existing funds that can, um, I believe, now give us time. We're still a matter of hours, um, but fortunately our state Budget and coffers uh, will be able to accommodate, I'll say that. But I think we've got what we need here from a state perspective and from the federal funds that will pull up our full history. Yes, sir. Yeah, we were all watching you. Delude <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah, this is probably for Ted. Do you mind stepping in the podium? Can I introduce yourself? Hello. My name is Ted Funk. I'm the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service. Ted, what time did the storm hit? How long did it go through? And we you know, do you know exactly the strength of the storm yet? Yeah, myself and uh, two of my colleagues, Jason Puma and Matt, Matt Eckhoff, who's here, there he is over here. We've been out, uh, and Shane from the Terre Haute Fire Department has been gracious enough to show us around. So we've been looking at uh, the damage across the region for several hours now. Um, we first issued a tornado warning for Sullivan County at 10.08 p.m. last night. The storm at that time was still in Illinois. That provided roughly 20, 22 minutes that we figure of lead time before that storm uh, came across the river here into uh, Sullivan County and the town of Sullivan. We saw the storm and, and how potent it was. We uh, upgraded that tornado warning to what we call a higher end version. It's called a considerable uh, tornado. And that also had lead time before it hit the air. So we've been out for the last few hours and trying to assess the damage. The way we rate uh, wind speeds with a tornado is we use the, what's called the enhanced Fujita scale. And what that does, you look at the degree of damage, of damage to different structures and from that, you estimate what the winds actually were. We don't, we don't uh, measure the winds directly. So, so far, this is still preliminary information. We still have to go back and um, look at the points that, that we took uh, along the damage path when we get back to our office. But at the moment, there is a lot of EF2 damage. EF2 is winds from 111 to 135 miles per hour. However, there's also locations, there's also particular areas where it's, it looks like it's EF3 damage. EF3 damage is from uh, 136 to 165. Now, we haven't figured out exactly the range in there, but there's some locations here where winds were likely over 135 up to about 165, and that does do extreme damage as, as we see. Um, so we're still assessing that. Um, we fell the storm likely was on the ground before it crossed the river, continued to cross through here, and then we uh, took some back roads into the woods and tried to find an area where it looks like the storm uh, lifted. So by the time it crossed the river to where we think it lifted, that was probably uh, on a line roughly 8 to 10 miles. So 
but we'll have to plot that out and see the exact numbers once we get back. Um, in terms of the path width, we were just, again, this is preliminary. We have to measure it out a little bit better. But we think maybe uh, the path width might have been roughly an eighth to a quarter of a mile, uh, you know, laterally. And then path length of about eight to ten miles. But that doesn't include when it likely was on the ground across the river in Illinois. And we will uh, coordinate with our, uh, our neighboring office, uh, the Lincoln, Illinois office, and they have a crew out looking at the same storm uh, in their area. So we'll coordinate with them and see eventually what the total length of time that this tornado was on the ground. And would you say uh, There's absolutely name? no doubt, obviously, it was a tornado. Say your name and title again, if you uh, would. My name is Ted Funk, F-U-N-K, meteorologist in charge, National Weather Service in Indianapolis. Thank you. And the time frame, maybe, for how long you went from Sullivan County? Uh, the storm was moving, I think, 40, 50 miles an hour. So, again, the, the initial tornado warning was issued at 10.08 p.m. I don't have uh, like the radar in front of me to determine exactly when that storm moved out. It did, the, the storm that produced the tornado, not necessarily the tornado, because the tornado wasn't all on the ground this whole way, but it, it clipped across, uh, eventually went into Owen County. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, I don't have the exact time it actually exited on, in Sullivan County. But the tornado itself was very quick to move through, uh, very quick. Uh, it's our, our deepest condolences on our hearts break for the you know, family of the loved you know, the, the, the ones who, who, who were lost in this terrible uh, tornado. Um, we're so glad that so many people did survive. And it, it's just, it's a very uh, hard brief uh, when we see this. Uh, what we try to do is to provide information and get warnings out in advance, and then people have an action plan that they know what to do and can take cover. And I guess if there's a silver lining, it's that, uh, you know, despite the tragedy, the terrible tragedy, that there wasn't more lives lost or people hurt, uh, despite their livelihoods uh, with their houses gone. And, terrible thing, obviously, and we just come out here to try to figure out what exactly happened as best as we can. Do you have any preliminary information from Johnson County as well? I, we do have crews out there. I do not have exactly what happened there yet. We, we've had three survey crews out in different uh, counties, including uh, Johnson across Central Indiana. It's likely we will be out again tomorrow because there's just too much damage across Central Indiana to really do it all in one day. And, and you got to do it right. You can't just come in and out. You've got to really you know, look at everything and, and when we just FYI when we do look at the structures and how much damage some things can look like you know it, it's terrible and really bad which it is but we also have to look at the construction of different types of, of houses and, and, and things of that nature because some homes we saw were you know completely destroyed but then there's other structures nearby that weren't nearly as bad and it's a, it's a factor of how well different things are constructed and whether they're bolted down or not um, because a a particular wind will do much more damage to a structure that's not uh, secured versus one that is secured. So we have to look at the big picture uh, when we're looking at uh, you know all the damage that we've seen today and, and, and in any storm survey. Do we know how much time, warning time people had from the time that the warning was issued by the National Weather Service to the time that the tornado actually started to impact the area? Yeah, when we looked at that, like I said, the first tornado warning, because that was in uh, Illinois at the time, it was 10 away p.m. But before that, we issued a what we call a, a special weather statement. It's not a warning, but it's a statement that we put out. Uh, 33 minutes. Uh, and by the way, oh, let me get back. I'm sorry, I should answer that. 10 away, which gave about 22 minutes of lead time, we estimated by the time the storm came across the river here in the Sullivan County. Uh, before that, we put out a special statement talking about a dangerous storm that would likely cross the river into Sullivan County. That was put out roughly at 3.30, 33 minutes ahead of time when it did. Uh, so that initial tornado warning, we figured it had roughly 20, 22 minutes of lead time. And then again, I said we had upgraded this, what's called a considerable tag, which is a higher end tornado warning associated with likely higher end damage. And that was, that went out at 10.17 p.m. And that we figured gave about, um, uh, about 12, 13 minutes of lead time before again it came through the cell phone. How common is a tornado of this intensity at this time of year? I know we're kind of getting into peak tornado season. Yeah, peak tor the traditional peak tornado season across the Ohio Valley in central Indiana 
is <clears throat> April, May, and June, but just know that severe weather and tornadoes can occur any time of the year. Just look in December 2021 down in Kentucky and Mayfield and Bowling Green and those areas. Those were devastating tornadoes, and that was in December. So while there's a more common time for severe weather and tornadoes, that being the spring, it can occur any time of year. Now, when you get into the summertime, when it gets uh, very hot out, you get thunderstorms, but usually you don't get the type of wind energy we need in the atmosphere to create these tornadoes. They can, but they're not quite as common. But we are entering into the prime severe weather season. Uh, <clears throat> we have actually been fairly lucky across uh, the area here over the last several years. While we've had tornadoes, we haven't had anything this devastating for quite a while. I asked uh, some of the, my uh, uh, staff back at the, in the office, when's the last time we had a magnitude tornado like this, or at least people who um, lost their lives in a tornado? And so far, what we can determine is uh, 2012, which was the Henryville tornado in southern Indiana. And uh, at that time, I actually worked at the Louisville, uh, Kentucky office, and we served that location. So I actually did a survey in those locations well at that time so uh, but it doesn't matter how infrequent they are the fact is one time is all it takes so we always stress that we want people to be to understand the weather pay attention to the weather have a way to get the warnings have an action plan of what to do once the warnings are, are issued and because we can issue the warnings but it's everybody's decision they have to have a plan they know have to, need to know what to do where to go to keep themselves and their loved ones safe Mayor Lamb, you had the governor right here. Um, what state resources, what state support do you need the most right now on the ground in Sully? Sure, we talked about that earlier before we came out here. We're going to continue that discussion today. Uh, obviously, our number one priority is definitely the people that are directly affected, right? We want to make sure that those people are taken care of. We want to make sure those people have the vouchers they need for the IHCDA. We need to make sure that those people have the transportation because a lot of the vehicles could have been damage so we can get them maybe to a hotel for 30 days but do we have the transportation so just understanding those resources and i, and I can say that the governor has brought on everything he's wide open he's he's here to, to do absolutely anything possible so then of course uh, we're going to eventually have this long-term conversation with the governor I know he's committed to hoosier communities and uh, we definitely know that he'll continue to be a partner like his administration has been here in the city of sullivan and like he alluded to earlier uh, there's going to be a silver lining in this and the south side of the city of Sullivan is going to be absolutely amazing. And you're all going to come back here in a couple of years to see exactly what happened as this remarkable community uh, continues to develop because of partnerships with the state government. Governor, do you anticipate needing to call out any of the guards who assist with some of the Well, I, if needed, if needed. Uh, but, you know, we got uh, the superintendent of the Indiana State Police over my right shoulder here. And his personnel will be fanned out across the state of Indiana, in their districts, in regions, DNR, in DOC, every agency that, that is affected or can have a positive impact on the recovery phase will be involved from last night through uh, to the very end till we see the, the new south side of Sullivan shining again. All good? Thanks. Real, real quick, Superintendent, if you could talk to us about the, kind of the long term. Yeah, following up with what the governor just said, we will maintain a presence here in Sullivan, uh, an increased presence. We always have a presence here in this county, an increased presence over the coming weeks and months, whatever that might be. So we'll continue to evaluate that each day. I, I would like to, to, to say, though, remember, this sometimes creates an opportunity for people who want to do nefarious things. Don't. Don't. Um, we will have a very strong set of eyes out there, and again, a very strong presence. Um, the Terre Haute PD has been down. There's been so many other agencies that have come into this community. And I, uh, I think it would be a disservice to you if I didn't at least mention that, that sometimes this creates a kind of opportunity. And uh, we'll do all we can do to prevent that. Additionally, uh, there have been a lot of people whose lives have been forever changed over the course of the last 18 hours. Please show deference to them in that particular area. As you want to come and see this, I uh, um, hope you don't want to come do anything other than help. But if you do want to help, please reach out to the city first 
The mayor has done an extraordinary job in a short period of time to establish that process by which people can come and help. We need resources. We need, I'm just going to say, we need, we need money. We're going to need additional people and, and, and products and equipment over a long period of time. So please take that opportunity. If you don't have a reason to be in that area, please stay away. It's still extremely dangerous. The power companies here have still an enormous amount of work to do. And uh, again, we'll continue to keep you updated and stay as engaged as we can. Uh, explain the curfew for tonight. Yeah, so uh, that, that curfew uh, starts at 7 p.m. this evening, and that is not a citywide curfew. That is just the affected areas, so people around the community don't have to worry about that. That will start at 7 p.m. this evening until 7 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning. We work with EMA, Sheriff Bobbitt, and we just thought it was a good idea. Uh, we, quite frankly, don't need people messing around and looking for things that, they, that don't need to be there, uh, for sure. And is that true? people unaccounted for? It is, it is my understanding right now that uh, we are still in a in a search and rescue mode. Uh, we're mostly in the uh, uh, rescue mode. We continue to move forward. So I cannot confirm or deny uh, because you don't know. Like we said earlier, we have two two hundred households that have been affected, but how many live in those households? So, uh, we feel, you know, cross your fingers. We feel pretty confident that we've pretty much uh, accounted for everybody and got to everybody, but I don't want to say that and then come to find out that somebody's still out there needing help. Which reminds me, if you do have a loved one, once again, that is missing or that you need some information on, you can come here to City Hall, 110 North Main Street. We will get your name, information. We will continue to, to reunite those folks. Do you have any family you're helping right now as far as in shelters or like people that have to use city services at the court. Well, well, last night, the, the original shelter was out at Abundant Grace, right, on Highway 41, because you all know that the entire city is power uh, So we kept them out Highway 41. Uh, a lot of those folks are going to be moving here to the Sullivan Civic Center, which is right behind you, to try to coordinate these efforts with uh, emergency management to the south of us on Main Street, the corner of Main and Harris, City Hall right here on Main Street, and then the Sullivan Civic Center as well. So, uh, yeah, we don't know, because some folks, we're helping assist, or the Red Cross and the Salvation Army is helping assist, but there's also a lot of families uh, that are helping assist too. So how long those families can continue to, to aid their loved ones, we don't know, right? And that's where the IHCDA is trying to uh, streamline a system to make sure that they get shelter for the next 30 days. Question for Superintendent Carter. Uh, you alluded to this uh, just now. Anytime we see a disaster like this, a lot of times it's when cherry scams start popping up. So what should our viewers watch out for before they say, okay, I want to come in and help, I want to send some okay. resources. It's so, uh, the foundation that, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I, I, want, I want to make sure that if you're going to contribute, a big thank you to the Wabash Valley Community Foundation, uh, which is the Sullivan County Community Foundation. Uh, they are an outstanding organization, philanthropical, that always steps up and helps out no matter what. They help out in the good times and they're ready to step up again now. So you can make your tax deductible contribution. <laughs> um, you can, uh, because there are a lot of people that want to help. They want to provide their talents, they want to provide water, they want to provide food, they want to provide shelter. But some folks just quite frankly want to uh, contribute financially. We have had a few people stop by City Hall today here and drop off some checks. Those checks will be deposited into the Community Foundation Fund. If you go to the City of Solomon, Indiana social media sites, that link will be there. So you can go right there, you can contribute $5, Ten dollars. We had somebody step up a while ago and give five thousand dollars, so we really appreciate that. And it will go into that specific fund, so it will, we will make sure we can assure you that it will be used for the tornado disaster relief. Mayor, and, and please, everybody, remember: do not give your credit card information over the phone. Do not give any credit card information over the phone. That's really important because I, that's a great question. That is probably very likely to happen here in the coming weeks. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Quick, Thank you. Real quick, uh, the job to, to you. We'll see you in the ICS. They, they feel everybody's talent for and cleanup operations will start in the morning. So. Thank you all.